Amen, amen. Y'all doing all right this morning, family? No, I guess not. I'll be praying for you guys during the sermon and make sure you don't fall asleep on me. <laughs> I'm not gonna make y'all say that again. Hey, thankful for the stars. We can be thankful for the scars, amen? Yeah. Maybe, uh, here's a question I have for you guys, though. Can we be thankful for our scars? Mm, mm. Well, I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, listen, we are in the middle of a series called In Training, where we're looking at the divine in discipline. And I have a question for you guys, right? Getting back to our scars. How many of you guys have ever heard this question? If you could talk to your teenage self, especially if you're not a teenager, guys, not yet, right, not yet. But if you could talk to your teenage self, go back and tell them something you know now, what would you tell them, right? What would you say? Would you say, don't eat the yellow snow? Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's important to you. Maybe relationships can wait. Uh, it's not a big deal uh, as you think it is. Or maybe it's something more along these lines. Just wait. I know it's tough right now, but just wait, right? It doesn't feel good right now, but it'll be worth it in the end. It won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. Can y'all think back to something that wasn't easy when you were in it, right? But, but when it was all said and done, you wouldn't change it if you could. Now, if this is your response, why is that? Why would you not change it even if it was hard then? It's usually because that scenario or that challenge or that trial has in some way shaped you for who you are today. Your perspective, your insight, your strength, even your faith. There was a famous pastor once who said uh, this. Anytime he came across anybody who had a unique perspective, a rich, unique perspective in life, he would stop and go, what happened to you? You see, he knew it was the fruit that had come through some trial or some challenge rather than just being born with that perspective. They had gone through something to have a perspective that was unique and rich compared to everything else. In fact, he understood one of our key verses that we've been going through this series. It's in Hebrews 12, 11. Read along with me. It said, no discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Do you hear that? Trained by discipline. The whole desire in this series is to understand that discipline is much more than just punishment. It's training, it's raising you up, it's child training. Discipline trains us whether or not we've actually done something wrong or not. So maybe you're in a challenge right now and you think maybe God is kind of working against you. Maybe you're just in child training just like a parent raises up their own child. Now if only though, right, today, if only we could kinda go ahead of ourselves and look back 15 or 20 years from now and go, hey, whatever you're going through right now, it's gonna be worth it. Or what if, what if we had a list of people that we could go to, hint, hint, and see what they went through and what they became? We do, it's right here in our scriptures. Right? Just before they discuss the persevering and discipline in chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews actually gives us a list of the heroes of the faith and what they went through, their child training, their discipline to get to that point. It's all in chapter 11 of Hebrews. That's a whole list. This list includes the likes of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses as well as Sarah and Rahab, and the list goes on, so much so that they don't even have enough time to talk about it. But they do make a list uh, in what they go through. Look, it's Hebrews eleven thirty-two, 32. And it says, and what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell all about Gideon and Barak and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. And this list goes on to all that they went through before they became the heroes that we, of the faith that we know them of, about. So you see, all of these heroes of the faith were not heroes of the faith at first. And the writer of the Hebrews is making this connection that their perseverance of their faith through God's discipline, through his child training, was raising them up for something for him and his glory and his people. In fact, this discipline, their trials and challenges, was building toward a promise 
Not because they did anything wrong, but rather because God had something in store for his people. You see, God's discipline, his child training, had everything to do with who he was trying to train them up to be for his glory. In fact, for our benefit as well. So today, we're going to look at one of these names on that list, the early life of Gideon, right? Because Gideon became a hero, but he didn't start that way. Gideon was an Old Testament judge, but not like judges that we understand today. A judge in the Old Testament was a person and a position which functioned like a spiritual and military and political leader, all wrapped up into one person in Israel. It's kind of a stretch, but it's kind of like the president, the pope, the Supreme Court, and the armed forces all wrapped up in one person. That's a lot of power. That's what a judge was for Israel. And he actually took a meager 300 men and defeated a 130,000 man Midianite army of 450 to one odds, and he won. That's pretty impressive. In addition, he, he reversed the spiritual climate of the entire state of Israel from idolatry to the loyalty to their God. However, Gideon did not start out that way, and we don't start out that way either. He didn't become a hero of the faith until he experienced his child training and discipline. So maybe what we're going through today, if you're going through anything at all, God isn't abandoning you, he isn't, he isn't punishing you, and maybe you need to be that, but that's a whole other conversation. Maybe he's trying to raise you into something that you can't yet see, and he knows what he's got to write in you. So let's meet Gideon before he understood the divine and discipline, and see how God raised him up in divine discipline to who he became that we just shared a few minutes ago. Now, as Pastor Rufus likes to share a sermon in a sentence, if this is a sermon in a sentence, you've got this. From Gideon, we learn that the truest thing about us is what God says, not what we think, not what others think, or even how we feel at times. All of those things can deceive us. So let me say it again. It's not what we think or others think or how we feel, but what God says about us. And we learn this in the life of Gideon. And we're gonna see how God's discipline, his child training, was used to correct Gideon's thinking to overcome challenges before he became the man of God that we call him today. So the first thing that Gideon had to overcome was his ignorance. Now, some of you guys might say, I know some people with some ignorance. It might not be that kind of ignorance I'm talking about, but bear with me. He had to overcome his ignorance or doubt, if you will, about the care and power of God the Father for his lifetime. When Gideon was first called by God, he was hiding from the Midianites while he prepared wheat, right? Because the enemies of Israel had pillaged and stolen food and all the stuff uh, in, in their land. And in God's initial greeting, God called Gideon a valiant warrior and informs him that he would go with him. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I think about a fearless warrior or a valiant warrior, I don't think about someone hiding in a wine press so his food doesn't get stolen. And neither did Gideon. So listen to this response that Gideon gives after God is speaking to him. It's in Judges 6, 13 through 14. It says this. Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is really with us, why has this stuff happened? And where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? They said, hasn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and it handed us over to Midian. You see, Gideon was growing up in a time where at least the last seven years that he has been living, the Israelites have been oppressed by the Midianites. They had been overrun and their land had become destroyed and it's barren. This was due to God's allowance because Israel was actually worshiping other gods. So Gideon's understanding of God was that he was absent, that he had abandoned them, not that Israel had walked away from God. You see, Gideon must have been thinking, well, I've heard about this God stuff, and that's who you say you're, you are, but I don't know any God that's working today in my present time. Is this sounding familiar to you guys? Maybe y'all have had some similar conversations. You look around our culture, our world, and wonder, where's God? What is going on? Right? I, I hear these stories of the Old Testament scriptures. I hear these stories of Jesus. 
But where is he now? See, Gideon's asking the same thing. For Gideon and for you and me, we might be listening to the wrong narrative, right? If we're not careful, what surrounds us becomes our truth rather than the actual truth. We look around and think, well, there must be no God, or at least he's absent of this place, not realizing it was actually the people who have walked away from God, not God from his people. Now, let me give you an example. <clears throat> There's a social media post going around with these stats, all right? It says something to this nature. A bottle of water can be $1 at the grocery store, $2 at the gym, $3 at the movies, and perhaps even up to $6 at the airport. Same bottle of water. The only thing that changes the value is the place. Here's my point. When we let our environment determine our value or our truth, we assume the environment's correct. God is telling Gideon who he is, but the environment Gideon is living in is telling him something different, and it's making it really hard for him to understand. So Gideon did not understand that God's power was available for him, not just his ancestors. So the Lord gave Gideon firsthand evidence of his power. So let me ask you, are you like Gideon? Is there a narrative that you're believing in because you're in the wrong place and you're seeing it from a different perspective and it's really hard for you to understand? Or perhaps you're so entrenched with what's going on around you that you ignore the hand that wants to guide you and lead you. Almost like that stubborn child, no, get away. Perhaps God is trying to speak to you today and ask you this, who are you listening to? Who's determining your truth? Everywhere else will tell you what they think about you, but it is only in the hands of God who can tell you who you really are. So are you like Gideon? Or perhaps you've had the chance to be blessed by God the Father and see his power in this lifetime. You see, experiencing that kind of power often can be in the form of discipline or child training, correcting a narrative that needs to be corrected in our lives. And that's what Gideon was learning too. He had to overcome that. But the second thing he had to overcome was his personal insecurities. You see, sometimes it's the culture that's directing our thoughts, right? On who God is, and sometimes it's our own insecurities. We think, uh, well, I'm, I'm nobody, right? God can't use me, he won't use me. I believe God uses other people, but that's for them, that's not for me. Right, that's a gift for somebody else, more holy, more pure, more righteous, older, younger, you name it. Fill in the blank, whatever you think disqualifies you. We start thinking of these things. And there is no difference from what Gideon was thinking also. In Gideon's call from God, God calls him a valiant warrior, but he didn't believe that. And then tells him, hey, you're actually gonna have the strength to deliver Israel from the hands of Midian, so go. Now, to get in and say, well, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it, woohoo! No, if you know the story at all, that is not what happened. In fact, he had some insecurities that he had to work through because God was child training him through it. Listen to Gideon's response in Judges, 15, or Judges 6, 15 through 16. He said to him, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the weakest in Manasseh. And I'm the youngest in my father's family, but I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will strike Midian down as if it were one man. You see, Gideon's, Gideon was put more weight on his own estimation about himself instead of the father God's evaluation of him. Is that hitting too close to home for some of us? Could we actually replace Gideon's name with ours? Chad put more weight in his own estimation about himself instead of God the Father's valuation of him. Hmm. You see, there is a saying in the productivity world that goes something like this. You can make excuses or you can make progress, but you can't make both. See, some of us may feel God tugging us to come toward him, fall in love with him, perhaps even serve him to some capacity. But instead of leaning in, we start reading our excuse list, our culture list, our insecurity list, and we're like, no, 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 no. That's not true. And we never make any growth or progress toward God. 
Or worse, some of us feel like our list of excuses or disqualifications are so long and so strong that there's no way God wants to use us now. We're too far gone. My family is the weakest, and I'm the smallest in the family. I'm not who you say I am, God. There's an old quote that's usually assigned to an English Victorian author that says this, it's never too late to be what you might have been. Mm. Now, now let me pause to clarify something here. <clears throat> I'm not talking about pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of mentality, right? Fix your stinking thinking kind of stuff. I'm not talking about that. This is not a motivational message for you to start thinking positive thoughts about yourself. You see, the distinct difference between a motivational message and the one that I'm sharing with you today is who the message is coming from. Gideon didn't say, man, the world is telling me I'm insignificant, but I'm gonna go work on myself, I'm gonna be, work hard because I believe I'm something important. No, that's not what Gideon is doing. Gideon is hearing the God of creation telling him, this is who you are and this is what your purpose is. Now I'm going somewhere, so I promise. Let me, let me ask you this question. Family, why do we preach? Why do y'all waste an hour of your day to come up here and listen to some awesome worship, my crazy voice, or whoever else is preaching that day? I assure you, it's not because you like my voice. It's quite nasally at times, <laughs> right? It's not just to make you feel better. We may use it as that. It's not just that you have a better week, although that can be fruit of it. Guys, the reason why we preach this word every week over and over again is because we believe these words the very words from God's own mouth and his heart to you are being read over you when we preach. Some of us, each weekend, it's the only time we actually get to hear God's word in our life poured over us. Now this is not a guilt thing, I ain't about that, right? I promise you. It's an illustration, watch this though. <clears throat> it's an illustration in this way because it's about whose words you're hearing most in your lives. If we know the culture says God is absent and abandoned us, and we know our own insecurities tell us that we're insignificant, what ratio do you hear these words compared to God's words? Are you hearing those words a lot more than what God is telling you who you are? You see, when we hear the message of our insecurities and the message of our ignorance and insignificance more often in this world, it is no wonder why we're hiding in the wine press. Amen? You see, it's, it's not what is being said that is the significant piece, but also who is saying it. When we preach, and Lord willing, when you're in God's word throughout the week every day, you're actually hearing a direct message from the Father God, the creator of heavens and earth, who knows your weaknesses, your failures, your insecurities, and your age. When he calls out to you, when you hear him call, He's the one that knows your purpose for his glory. That means something different. That's my creator reminding me who I am and what I was created for. So the next time you start making excuses, try and determine who is saying it. Determine whose voice is more important in your life. The culture, news, social media, yours, or God's. And if you can, adjust your life so God's word takes more precedence in your life, more consistency in your life, so you too will begin to see the child training discipline that God is working you through. He is not punishing you, he is raising you up against a world who does not want you to know who he is and what he has for you. All right, lastly, before I start preaching, Gideon had to overcome his fear for doing right. Gideon had to overcome his fear for doing right. So Gideon was being disciplined. He was child trained to overcome his ignorance and his insecurities, but fear remained. See, up to now, you might be thinking, personally, I believe in God, and I know he wants to use me. But you're still sitting on the sidelines. That's as far as you've gotten your relationship with him. Is it fear of the unknown that is keeping you there? What would change? Who you would offend or isolate yourself from if you spoke up? If so, Gideon is still a witness for you today too. 
So God was patient with Gideon, overcoming the narrative in his life, the environment in his life, the disciplining challenges. And now God says, okay, now that you hear me here, get rid of those false gods your father is worshiping. Take a step. Make a choice. Tear down their altars and build one for me. But here's the catch. The Bible tells us because Gideon was too afraid of his father's family and the men of the city, he did it in the middle of the night. He did it, but he was still hiding. And he was right to be afraid because he had to overcome it. He had to hold on to some truth that God had given him, some promise that God had given him. Read with me in Judges 6, 28 through 30. It says, when the men of the city got up in the morning, they found Baal's altar torn down. They said to each other, who did this? After they made a thorough investigation, they said, Gideon, son of Joash, did this. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son, he must die, because he tore down Baal's altar. Now Gideon had to make a decision to listen to his fear or to listen to what God was instructing him and directing him in. And we have to do the same thing in our lives today. Do you wanna bring glory to God or do you wanna listen to your fear that keeps you on the sidelines? See, can people see we are a people of God by our faith and the way that we're living and what we speak and what we say? Are there things in our lives we hold on to that needs to be torn down? Or are we afraid we're not tearing them down so others won't come after us or disagree with us or even disown us? Whose voice are we listening to? You see, growing in righteousness will sometimes cause us to be persecuted from our friends within and even enemies without. Are we too concerned with the fear we have versus the purpose of God and what he's called us toward? It's something we need to consider. Because you know fear paralyzes, right? It keeps us stuck in status quo. It keeps us stuck in the narrative that's around us. Nothing changes in the voices that are in our head. I love what John Acuff, an author and leadership speaker, says about fear. He says this, fear comes free, hope takes work. Hear that, fear comes free, hope takes work. He goes on to say, you don't have to say, hey, today I'm going to deliberately think these negative thoughts about myself. I have to insert everything that I want to say badly about myself. He, he said, you don't have to work for that. Something like you're walking through the grocery store and like, hey, today at the grocery store, I'm going to remember that dumb thing I said to my friend about three years ago and feel really, really bad about it. We don't have to do that. It comes free. He says, fear will find you. You never have to go looking for it. Hope takes work. We have to make a decision to overcome fear. We can't just think, well, one day I won't be fearful. We have to approach it head on. So the question remains though, what hope do we have to overcome fear? For Gideon, it was trusting from whom the promise was given and the words that were being read into his life and spoken into his life. But even more, it was specific things that God made sure to tell him in his child training. Judges 6.12, I am with you. Judges 6.14, I am sending you. Judges 6.16, I will be with you. Judges 6.23, peace to you, do not be afraid, for you will not die. These are promises that God was specifically giving to Gideon to hold on to, to overcome his fear in the child training discipline. You see, I believe these words that Gideon held on to, uh, to, to overcome his fear is something we can hold on to as well. Something that we can hold on to and make a decision to move on and past our fear. We need to hold on to those promises as well. And he's given us a great example in the life of Gideon as we work through our sufferings and trials and discipline. So as I come to a close, remember our sermon in a sentence again. From Gideon's life, we learn that the truest thing about us is what God says, not what we think, not what others think, or even how we feel about ourselves. We see that through child training, God corrected Gideon's ignorance, his understanding, and his fear. Not because he did anything wrong, but because he was being made into his purpose for God's glory. Now you might be experiencing God's discipline today, his child training, and you might have it to fight to overcome these things as well, but it's not because you did anything wrong. It might have been, but not always. 
It might be because he's trying to raise you to overcome the same things, ignorance, insecurity, and fear. See, we need God's word to correct our ignorance, not reinforce what the culture says. God is here today for our time, calling out to you. We need his word to correct our insecurities, hear what God says we are, not what the world or the brokenness around us makes us think we are. We need his word to push us in our decisions, past our fear, so we can fulfill our purpose for his glory. The word isn't always easy to digest and put into action, but it's worth it. It's a training for us to be called into our purpose for him. So how do we persevere in our discipline, in our trials and sufferings, when everything else is speaking louder and against what we hear from God? We remember the same thing Gideon did. So whatever you're going through, whatever trials you have or may come, think these things. I am with you. I am sending you. I will be with you. Peace to you. Do not be afraid, for you will not die. See, it's no coincidence that Jesus, the supreme pastor, the supreme shepherd, priest, author, everything that Gideon was supposed to be, Jesus perfected it. And he repeats these exact same words, similar to us, for our own life. In Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go, I am sending you, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember... I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Your heart must not be troubled or fearful. Sounds a lot like what God told Gideon. It's very similar to what God has told us in our purpose to share his love and his joy in this world. Hold on to these words. Hold on to God's words as you overcome fear and persevere in your own discipline. For God is raising you for his purpose and his glory and his praise. So just like young Gideon, if you are in a time of trial or suffering, remember God might be child training you toward your purpose. The book of Hebrews is here to remind you to hold on. Do not grow weary. There is fruit that will come because of this season. Let's pray. Dear God, perhaps your word has stirred something in our heart to seek you more. Help us overcome our own fears and insecurities and ignorance. May we hear your words louder than the words of the world. And God, if we don't know you, and we think you've abandoned us, may you reach into our lives as you've reached into Gideon and call us to you. May we find the strength to get past the fear to actually grow closer to you, come to know you perhaps even for the first time. Be with us in all of our trials, but also all of our celebrations, for you are good, and we want the world to know. And then we pray. Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at hopechurchmemphis.com slash prayer and subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.